This is a, a forum that is put on by the Chamber of Commerce and we represent the Bloomington business community. And we, there are gonna be other great forums that are being put on. I know that Rotary is hosting one uh, in October, as well as coming up here in September, the League of Women Voters are doing a great job putting together a forum that will be in the evening that will be open to other questions. So with that, why don't we go ahead and Robert, um, if you would like to introduce Thank them. Thank you, Kim. Thank you everyone for being here this morning. Thank you to all the candidates. The, um, we really appreciate your attendance. Um, <clears throat> I would like each candidate to introduce themselves. Let's start with Tim on the far end and work all the way down. Um, make an opening statement. Please remember you have a minute. Just state what office you're running for and, uh, and talk about yourself for a minute. So let's go ahead and start. And uh, remember, everybody, please be polite. Good morning, everyone. My name is Tim Bussey, and I'm very proud to be running for mayor of Bloomington. I've been on Bloomington City Council for the past eight years, and in each of those eight years, I have been a vocal and active and very visible supporter of the Bloomington Chamber of Commerce and the great work that gets done by the chamber. I've been on the chamber board for the past eight years. I chaired the Bloomington annual, the chamber annual gala, which is the largest fundraiser for the chamber, for five years. And uh, each year that I played in the Chamber Golf Tournament, I've somehow managed to finish dead last each year that I played. Uh, I'm really proud to be part of an organization that not only does its mission of supporting and, and do, doing well by business in Bloomington, but is such an active and uh, great participant in the greater community of Bloomington uh, and partners so well with the Bloomington uh, city government on, on issues like uh, uh, transportation issues and on different programming like the uh, uh, the state of the city address and uh, a, a number of business matters, safety matters, and other things. Those uh, partnerships make us all stronger. And when I'm mayor, we're going to continue to do that and look forward to uh, to being your mayor. So thanks much for being here on this rainy morning. Thanks much. All right, let's go next, Ryan. Uh, hello, my name is Ryan Kolka. I am a lifelong resident of Bloomington, and I'm running for mayor. Um, I graduated from Bloomington Jefferson High School and studied entrepreneurship at the University of St. Thomas. And for the last 10 years, I've been creating jobs and making investments in Bloomington as a small business owner uh, here in the community. Um, right now, I feel that there's a, a big groundswell of people in the community that yearn for transparency and want city leaders um, and individuals who can listen and represent the, the voice of the citizens. Uh, I'm also a proponent of lowering barriers to entry and loosening regulations for small businesses, and we need to make it easier for small businesses to, to set footholds here in the city. And I also want to increase the financial responsibility that occurs um, within our, uh, our city budgeting and that our community is, is set up well for the future is a high priority for me. Um, I want to help make Bloomington attractive and welcoming uh, for every small business, young family, and diverse members of different cultures. So for these reasons, um, I'd love to be your next mayor of Bloomington. All right, Jenna. Hi, everyone. My name is Jenna Carter, and I'm running for the Bloomington City Council at-large seat. I just want to start by thanking the chamber. Thank you, Kim, Robert, Anna, for all of the work you did to put this on, put this together, and give us this opportunity. Thank you all for being here today. So I live in Bloomington with my husband, Mike, and our two kids. I grew up a military brat. I went to Iowa State for my undergraduate degree. And then I came up to the University of Minnesota and got my master's degree. So for over 10 years now, um, the majority of those working at Blue Cross um, over in Egan, I have been working with communities and leaders across our state to really ensure that we have welcoming, vibrant, prosperous communities where everybody has the opportunity to prosper and thrive and live healthy and well. Um, as a Bloomington resident, I serve on the board of directors for VEEP, one of our local nonprofits. I've been involved with some housing coalition work. I volunteer in our schools. And I just wanna say that I'm really excited to be here today. Um, you know, my way of working is really in partnership and the business community is a really key partner in our community to contributing to that healthy, vibrant um, Bloomington that we all want. So thank you all again for coming today. Thank you very much. Next on the list. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Brian Clemens. Uh, most people call me Clem. Uh, I grew up in Bloomington, uh, over 44 years strong, uh, on the east side, although apparently there's no east and west Bloomington anymore. I'll tell you, I grew up on the east side. Uh, I'm running for city council at large. Uh, 
I have a family that lives in Bloomington um, and a wife and two kids. Uh, I've been a fireman for over 19 years here in the community. So community service is important to me. I'm also a small business owner within Bloomington. Uh, I own a number of uh, rental properties for single family homes. Uh, I do some development and building homes. I'm working on development projects with the city right now to, uh, to renovate some uh, downtrodden areas of our fine city. And uh, small business has been part of my life, my whole life. My father owned a small grocery store growing up that uh, he brought me down to and taught me how to run so that I would know the difference between working for someone else and working for myself. So I respect all the things that it takes to run a small business and to build something from nothing. And I really wanna see the city of Bloomington find ways to work harder with small business owners. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you. I'm Council Member Dwayne Loman in the first district and I'm uh, happy to, to be here this morning to continue our conversation. Uh, while I was born and raised uh, here in Bloomington, my wife was not. She's from a small town uh, in Ellsworth, Wisconsin. And so uh, it doesn't matter whether you were born here or whether or not you're, you've uh, made this uh, your home. Uh, certainly, uh, one of the priorities and things that I would like to work forward uh, towards is cultivating a community of choice. Really in Bloomington, my entire experience of growing up here and going to Kennedy High School and being a part of their entrepreneurial program that they had there uh, has been about a community that is welcoming to all, uh, whether that be business or that be residents. And also, uh, I've really enjoyed my partnership over the last six years on council, uh, particularly working with sustainability in the chamber. Uh, a number of partners here, the Mall of America, have been very instrumental in that, and I look forward to continuing that work. And thank you, and I look forward to having this conversation. All right, go ahead. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Al Nord. I'm running for City Council District 1. Um, I'm a lifelong Bloomington resident and I own a small business located here in Bloomington. Um, I've been married to my wife, Dawn, for 23 years. Um, we have two kids. One is a freshman in Mankato State University right now, and the other is a senior at uh, Kennedy High School. Um, my wife and I both graduated from Kennedy, and after high school, um, I attended Hennepin Tech. I do not have a business degree, but I do have a business that is successful in many different degrees. Um, I look forward to this forum, and I hope a lot of good information is shared. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Sean. Yeah. Um, first, thank you to the Chamber for hosting this event. Um, thank you to my fellow candidates uh, for all being here to have these conversations, and thank you for attending this morning on a rainy day. Uh, very much appreciate the opportunity to talk with you. Uh, my name is Sean Nelson. I'm the uh, District 2 Council member. I uh, have served for two years, and it's been a, a real honor to serve the community. <laughs> I've lived here for 20 years, my wife and I and our two daughters, uh, um, my wife's Anne, my daughter Stacia and Emma, really have loved living here. It's a great community. Uh, we enjoy the parks, the schools have been excellent, um, all of the organizations that we've been able to be engaged in. Uh, it really, is, it's just a great place to raise a family. Um, I am a small business owner. Uh, I own two companies, an award-winning residential design build remodeling company and a skylight and uh, installation and repair company. I have a business degree from Valparaiso University and an MBA from the University of St. Thomas, and I've been engaged uh, for over 15 years uh, in the business community as a leader. Currently serve on the Burnsville Chamber of Commerce. I am a member of the Bloomington Chamber of Commerce as well, so thank you again for coming. All right, and last but not least, Susan. <laughs> My name is Susan Woodruff, and I am running for District 2, and I thank you all for showing up this morning. Um, I've lived in Bloomington all my life. Both my parents were, small, were business owners here. My mother owned the Bloomington Roller Rink at 9412 Lindale, which is where AutoZone is now. And my dad owned Millhouse Steel Products that was actually um, right where we are sitting right now. I love this city, and uh, Bloomington is a big city with a small town feel. I wanna maintain that nature of this community. I have been I have a keen interest in supporting you, the owners and operators of small and large businesses in this community. <clears throat> I have been, uh, I respect you for the work you do and the taxes that you pay. You maintain our vibrancy. I would look, f I would look forward to working with you uh, as a city council representative. 
All right, Kim Hudson. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to mention thank you all for not sweating profusely during these opening <laughs> statements because it feels like you are under interrogation with these lights. Uh, we apologize if the optics are a little strange. We've tried to adjust them and we just can't. So thank you for just going with it. Y'all look great, by the way. Uh, so I can almost see you all. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> all right. Robert's going to kick us off with some questions. And don't forget, you're all on TV. So. If that, if that helps you sweat any less. <laughs> <laughs> I douse it. I saw I just oh, that was good. <laughs> so, but good one. For, for local cable. So. Um, all right. So let's start with a question, and we'll start with Susan and work our way back. So what are the development priorities that you see for Bloomington in the next five years? Well, we certainly need to look at housing and uh, and uh, what we're going to do to help our seniors who either A, want to stay in their homes or B, want to get uh, into a, you know, affordable or apartment living, so to speak. Um, I would be very interested in supporting uh, single family homes with owners who want to have roommates, so to speak, to uh, allow them to stay in their homes and give other people a uh, place to live. Uh, so I would like to, s we obviously have to do a lot of development. I would like to see it not in big chunks, but small chunks all over the city. All right, very nice. And just to remind you, you have a minute limit for qu responses. So. Did I go past? No, you're fine. I'm just reminding because I forgot to do it before. Okay, sure. Uh, Same right. question. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about what we are able to accomplish in the last couple of years, particularly with the Opportunity Housing Ordinance, uh, by bringing together those that are cost burdened, looking for housing that they are struggling to afford, uh, advocacy groups, uh, community leaders, and importantly, the business community, developers and builders. We put together an ordinance that I truly believe will lead to more housing that families can afford, as well as market rate housing. And um, so I'm very proud of that accomplishment, and it wouldn't have happened without being able to work with the business community to make sure the ordinance will actually work. Uh, we've also developed a plan for the Gateway District, which is kind of the heart of our city in East Bloomington there, for redevelopment of many of those commercial nodes, for Lindale, things of that nature. Uh, was able to get uh, a lot of that as a priority to really look at those commercial nodes within our community. Um, and so those are some of the things that I have been working on that we'll continue to work on. All right, thank you. Al? Um, I believe the city could really use a lot more senior housing. The population is aging quite a bit now, and they're going to need places to transition when they're unable to maintain their homes anymore. Um, more affordable housing would be a high priority also. Um, and trying to uh, attract more manufacturing businesses into the city would be a wonderful thing to have by lowering some regulations and giving some tax incentives. Cause I believe uh, manufacturing jobs um, tend to pay higher paying wages, so it uh, helps people afford the homes located in Bloomington. Okay, Dwayne? Well, I wish I had more than a minute to talk about all of the development that we've got going on in the city. Uh, certainly, Council Councilmember Nelson mentioned the, the Gateway Project, which is something we've really been focusing on trying to, to move forward, you know, re revitalizing our neighborhood uh, commercial areas along with the housing that's out there. We've got a number of uh, housing projects out there for apartment buildings, especially in the senior uh, area, which uh, Al had, had brought up. We've got the water park and so many other uh, amenities that are out there. But the thing we really need to be thinking about as we look to the future is all of our aging infrastructure. That's a critical part of, of, of that development piece. It, it's not as exciting, but we've got to make sure that we're, we're attending to that. And we are looking into that and trying to make sure that we can, can move forward. Uh, some of our parks that are aging, some of the water infrastructure that's underneath the, uh, the areas. Uh, and we also cannot forget the, the water park uh, at the Mall of America. Um, we've got just uh, incredible amounts of, of development going on in, in Bloomington. Across our three districts, we need to make sure that we're also paying attention to those as well. All right, thank you for respecting the time limit, even though reluctantly. Uh, Clem, I, I only met you a few minutes ago, but I'm going to call you Clem. You know it. So same question for Clem. What do you see as the development priorities for Bloomington for the next five years? Uh, thanks. Yeah, um, I, you know, I, I look at the the transportation in the city, and I think that the transportation needs work. Um, the infrastructure is uh, is not conducive to adding more density right now. Um, I I do uh, personally participate in trying to create more affordable housing uh, within the city, working on uh, development projects, both residential, um, uh, mid level, and high level density 
residential projects. So, uh, you know, finding places in Bloomington that are run down that could be something great is a great idea to me. Taking amenities that we currently have, like Valley View Park, and taking those out to put up a 25-foot concrete building, I'm not for. So respecting the amenities we have while looking at busy corridors, looking at major <laughs> thoroughways, and, and looking for redevelopment opportunities to, if we need to bring density, bring it along the main thoroughways, uh, 494, 35W, look at those, and then from there, uh, you know, reach out to look at the aging housing within this community and find ways to make it better. All right, thank you. Jenna? Yeah, so my background is in health, public health and health care, and I see those two things directly linked to economic development. Um, and so very related to some of my top priorities as I'm running, um, one of those being reinvestment and redevelopment in our neighborhood business corridors. So, you know, I think that the city has done a really good job working with the business community. There's been a lot of reinvestment in the South Loop area and along 494. And now we need to see that same level of investment and attention paid to our neighborhoods and our business corridors within those. Um, I also would like to see uh, an analysis, a market analysis done where we're looking at, you know, what are we doing really well in Bloomington, but then also what are some barriers that may be in place that are preventing small businesses and developers um, from coming to Bloomington and maybe choosing other cities. And so, um, and as we are redeveloping in our neighborhoods and in our business areas, you know, I would like to see a really um, a strong focus on transit-oriented development so people can um, access jobs and healthcare and food, and then also on uh, making sure that we have mixed income housing and affordable housing options for our workforce. Very nice, Ryan. <coughs> Thanks, I am also a, a proponent of um, helping develop some of our aging infrastructure. Um, there's a lot of empty storefronts in Bloomington. There's a lot of aging office, um, office parks and office buildings in Bloomington. And I think to attract new businesses into our city, we need to focus on what already exists here. Sometimes new development is not the best way to go, especially when, um, when city taxpayer dollars can sometimes be a part of subsidizing that. You can start to get into a, a, a financial hole that's, that's not really um, ideal. Um, also, I think development should come in, in terms of partnerships. We need to develop um, educational partnerships so that as more businesses you know, come into Bloomington, we're creating programs and partnerships that train people up, create partnerships with businesses that uh, work to provide more internships and apprenticeships so that as we build our business community, we can get more people into, into high paying jobs. All right, thank you. Tim? I've been saying for a couple of months now that uh, one of my key priorities as mayor will be to be uh, to kickstart our neighborhoods, to revitalize our neighborhood commercial nodes, and to spur development along our major streets in Bloomington. We've done a number of things over the past few years on the Bloomington City Council to do just that. Uh, we have had for the past couple of years our home improvement loans and our curb appeal loans, which provide low interest loans to homeowners to, to reinvest in their homes and, and to improve the look and the feel of their home, which is outstanding. We recently uh, approved a gateway development district, which uh, includes much of the east side, but it does push a little bit into the west side of Bloomington uh, in an effort to, to revitalize areas in, uh, in that part of the, the community. And uh, we directed staff not too long ago to apply for a HUD grant that will be a, a revolving loan fund to help fund improvements in that area. And finally, uh, building along our, our major streets, we, we have plenty of opportunities. We've established also a Lindale Avenue redevelopment zone which uh, we, we expect to, to try and uh, redevelop and, and revitalize the, uh, the properties and the, the empty uh, land on uh, Lindale Avenue as well. Thank you very much. I'm going to hand over to Kim. All right. Uh, there are a few seats over here. We've got some folks that are standing or in the hallway. If you'd like to grab a seat, uh, you can certainly do so. I've got a question for the mayoral candidates, and why don't we switch the order uh, since, since Tim just finished, Ryan, if you could take this first. Transportation is a top concern. I've heard it mentioned already on the panel, uh, especially for our Bloomington businesses, wanting to make sure that we get commerce moving, goods and services, and customers to them. What can be done to improve congestion from your perspective? Well, I think one of the, one of the major things that, that can be done is um, you know, opening up our roads. There's been a big, there's been a big movement as far as you know, creating uh, large bike lanes and things that take away from our, our roadways. I don't think the answer is, is, is congesting traffic in our neighborhoods. We need to make sure that, number one, um, businesses are able to conduct business and get their goods and services in and out, but that also um, employees have, have good and easy access to um, affordable transportation to get to and from work. So I think that's, that's a high priority 
for businesses and um, as mayor I would ask for the voice of the people to uh, give input as far as what they feel is important to them um, as far as transportation and employment goes. Tim? Well, uh, there, there's two pieces of it. I think there's the, 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 uh, the business and transportation and transit of goods. And so uh, I know that the Bloomington Chamber was very instrumental in securing the, uh, the funding for the 494-35W uh, redevelopment that's going to happen. We're going to be adding lanes to uh, 494 and redoing that, uh, starting the work to redo the interchange at 35W and 494, which is among the worst in the nations. And that's that was a, a multi-year effort by the, the council and uh, by the city of Bloomington and the community of Bloomington and the Bloomington Chamber, as I said, played a great role. The other part of this is, uh, of course, getting people to their jobs. And I think we need to focus on, uh, on a variety of ways to move people across the city of Bloomington, uh, whether it's uh, in improving and uh, moving uh, automobile traffic in, in more efficient ways, whether it's through design or, or uh, road construction. I think we need to offer transit alternatives, and I'm glad to see some of the transit alternatives we have coming to Bloomington, including the Orange Line. We need to get the D line funded between uh, Maple or Brooklyn Center and the Mall of America, and uh, just to, and, and bike lanes. I, I don't have a problem with bike lanes. I, I think it offers one more option and one more opportunity for folks to get to and from where they're going. Okay, thank you, Robert. All right, another softball question for me. <clears throat> um, let's start with um, Susan again, because she's been quiet for a while. <laughs> Susan, um, do you think city government should do more or do less? And this is for everyone. This is for everyone. I'm sorry, all across the down the line. Um, I think that sometimes city, our city government can be overbearing, especially for small business in this town. Um, I've heard stories from people where navigating uh, the avenues to get businesses open here and uh, up and running have been difficult and, and actually challenging for them. So that's my answer. <laughs> all right, Sean? Um, tough question, actually. Um, my answer would be yes, we should do more and we should do less. It depends on the area and we have to be thoughtful about it. Um, the areas that I think we should do more on is we need to, um, you know, we need to address the mental health crisis within our community. We're working with our police department and our public health department to find resources to be able to help those people in need, those uh, children in our schools that are in need. Uh, but there are areas that we need to do less of. Um, I think regulations are an area that we've looked at. We, we did it with housing. I talked about the opportunity housing ordinance. And one of the reasons I believe that'll be successful is we're able to reduce and relax some regulations to make it easier to build projects in our community. We're looking at the same thing in the restaurant, food truck, uh, tap rooms. There's a ballot uh, question on uh, this fall's election uh, regarding uh, liquor or uh, cha uh, charter amendment regarding liquor so we could allow more uh, opportunities for tap rooms and things of that nature so it really depends on the issue and we need to be thoughtful and uh, as we look at all of these issues. Let's do Jenner and Clem next. Start with me? Yep, sorry. <laughs> yeah, so um, so I also agree. I think we can do less and I think we can do more. Um, when, As I mentioned in my last um, answer, you know, I do think that we have probably some barriers in place for small businesses um, and, and corporations in Bloomington. So really doing an analysis and make sure that we can be, um, you know, more business friendly. And then in terms of doing more, you know, one of the big reasons that I decided to run for Bloomington City Council is because we have increasing rates of student homelessness in Bloomington. Um, at, the, at the end of the last school year, we ended with 280 homeless students. Um, and so I do think that the city has a role in addressing this crisis that we're seeing in bringing partners together, business leaders, our school district, our nonprofits, um, philanthropy that exists in Bloomington, creating a group, a coalition, where we can start digging into what's really going on in our community. Because like I mentioned before, the health and the vibrancy of our community is directly related to the economic development and prosperity of our community. All right, Clem. Um, you know, Growing up here, I know quite a few uh, small business owners in town, medium-sized business owners in town, and large business owners in town, and all of them have struggled at times with the city in regards to um, taking on new properties as potential headquarters, as potential places to work. Um, you know, the, the big push that I'd have is is for the city to do what they've done for the opportunity housing with businesses. If, you, if there's dilapidated businesses within town, don't make it so hard for a new business to move in and fix those places up. Don't require them to get from zero to 100% code compliance within the first six months of them being there so that these places can get filled up and not be a blight on our city. 
On the other side, you know, I, I have to say that I think that uh, that the city with the opportunity housing ordinance, I'm trying to take advantage of that right now to create two new developments within town. And the work that they've done has been awesome for developers in the residential space. It just needs to translate over to businesses as well. Oh, I'm sorry. Let's do it now. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so what I've learned from being a senior operational analyst is the, the paradigm of doing more uh, with less. And that's really what uh, we've had to, to learn how to do uh, at the city uh, of Bloomington. Um, one of the things that we've got to do and we have been doing is we've been partnering uh, not only with the private sector, but also uh, with, uh, with other, other government entities uh, that, are, that are doing things. And we need to continue uh, to, to look forward uh, to trying to do that. One of the things that I saw in the, the recent Bloomington uh, briefing was that, you know, that Bloomington's open to business. We've got a, 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 a program that allows for uh, those folks who are interested in being entrepreneurs um, in the city, um, that they can get a, uh, learn how to, to do cash flow analysis, uh, loan packaging, and, and, and microfinancing. Uh, we need to be able to partner with those folks that want to be able to maybe fill out our, uh, our storefronts. So it, government cannot be the, the answer to everything. We've got to be able to, to, to work and move forward uh, in a partnership manner. Go ahead. Um, I would agree with uh, Sean and Jenna saying that government should do less and more in some instances. Um, they should stick to the stuff that they're good at, like keeping take, taking care of the infrastructure, keeping our roads and, and streets well taken care of, um, funding the police and the fire, which is all stuff they do very well, um, but lessening regulations on businesses to, to uh, expand and open up in the city would be a much better thing to do than to keep putting more and more regulations on businesses and holding them back. All right, and finally, let's do uh, uh, Tim and Ren. I, I love going last in these because you basically just say, yeah, what they all said. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I'd, I'd look at it in this way. Uh, any, any services that a city provides is basically a reflection of the, the, the goals and the priorities and the, the capacity of the community that they belong in, that they are part of. And uh, here in Bloomington, our, our city council, we have set six strategic priorities that we've been working toward over the past five years or so. And what the, the services the city provides reflects those priorities, whether it's sustainability or renewing community amenities or parks and trails or that type of thing. And so, yes, we should be doing more. Yes, we should be doing less. Uh, actually, my council colleagues can tell you that uh, my, my reputation on the council is uh, I'm the stop doing guy. I think every good organization should have a stop doing list. What should we no longer do for whatever reason? and have been pushing that for the past eight years. And uh, it's been an interesting discussion because it makes you think a little bit more about the services provided and how it reflects and how it uh, fulfills the needs, the wants, the strategic priorities of a community. Um, I do agree that the city should continue doing things that help to serve the community and that make things easier for people. Bloomington does a really good job at offering um, social services and public health um, and things that, that make people's lives better. Um, but I've just heard some horror stories in talking to small business owners as far as um, them not even recommending that other small business owners come in and, and open their doors in Bloomington. Um, there, there's countless examples of people getting 75% of the way through opening a business just to be you know, hit with um, code and regulations from the city that add hundreds of thousands of dollars um, and are potential, and in some cases real, barriers to them actually opening their doors. So um, I think the, the city needs to continue doing the things that they're good at to serve the community and do less as far as making things hard uh, for people and for small businesses. All right, thank you all. Uh, this is for everyone as well. Uh, would you support $15 an hour minimum wage? Or if you have an alternative that you'd like to propose or you'd be interested in seeing a, an alternative proposed to that. Let's start with Al and uh, Dwayne. Um, I would not support the city getting involved in making an artificial minimum wage. Um, I think um, wages should be driven by the market. Um, and if a city is just going to put a minimum wage on its people, then it uh, causes other businesses to move out of the city. Um, if the state was going to do it, then I guess we'd have to go along with it, but uh, I like wages to be market-driven. Okay. Dwayne? 
Thank you. I think that uh, in terms of uh, minimum wage, um, it's interesting when you th talk about $15. I remember about 20 years ago, I was making $15 an hour, uh, you know, working, uh, working uh, actually uh, for the city at that point in time, um, in other places. We've got to look at the reality of the situation that we're in. And as I've always said to this group, um, you know, which I'm a member of, is that we've got to have a conversation about this. Uh, we, we cannot, um, and I've, I've even opened this up uh, to folks at the, the Mall of America, and I, I open that up to you. We need to have a conversation about uh, where we're going to go in terms of solving inequities that we have in our society. This is a, a great case of where, um, you know, if we want to have uh, residents that can be able to live in our community, um, we need to be able to be sure that they can afford to be able to pay for the housing. It's got to be affordable. They've got to have that. And so I'm willing to look at uh, that and also willing to consider other alternatives. But we, we cannot simply turn away and, and, and not say anything. Folks have got to be able to work at the Mall of America. People have got to be able to afford to live in this community. All right, Sean and Susan, please. Thank you. Um, I, at this point, I, I don't uh, fully support a $15 minimum wage. I, uh, I, I, one of the things we looked at at a recent council meeting was the loss of uh, naturally occurring affordable housing. And what uh, we saw was that the increase in cost for housing has far outpaced the increase in wages within our community. And so I think that we have both sides to look at. We have that cost basis, which we're, we're trying to address, transportation issues to get people to jobs and things like that. I think that's an area where um, particularly local government can play a very important role. Um, but I do think, to be perfectly honest, that we're going to have a conversation as a community about $15 hour, uh, minimum wage, as well as other wage and benefits. And that conversation needs to include the business community. We absolutely need your voice heard on that, how it will impact you and things like that, so that we can make good decisions as we go forward. Um, because I, I do believe this conversation is coming up in the next couple years. Great, Tim and Ryan. Oh, Susan, oh, Susan, I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so sorry. I think the $15 an hour uh, wage limit would should be uh, addressed at the state level. Um, the it's been argued that people that have to pay $15 an hour uh, would maybe have less employees because they couldn't afford to pay more. But I also think that it should take a natural. Uh, it will take a natural evolution, especially as. Um, we aging baby boomers who only had one or two children, uh, there's less people to fill the job market, and so that will drive the wages up naturally. Susan, thank you for uh, dealing with my gaffe. Uh, Tim and Ryan. Um, I'm not for uh, raising the, the minimum wage to $15. It, it's been proven in other communities and economies that, that it doesn't work, and it, it's a, it's a Band-Aid to a greater symptom. Right now, with unemployment so low, um, I, I don't think it's a, a necessary thing to, to occur. You know, the, the directly relative relationship is between um, uh, unemployment and minimum wage. When you raise, min raise minimum wage, you raise unemployment. It's an economic fact. So I think uh, in, in, in addition, we should, we should train people up and give them the job skills necessary to make their maximum wage, um, help them and help the city support programs like DECA um, who supports you know, high school students in getting out there and getting uh, real world experience in jobs. Let's set up partnerships with local businesses so that um, those that aren't college bound and want to get trade skills can have apprenticeships at local businesses to get those skills and so that they don't have to worry about uh, making minimum wage, they can make their maximum wage. Thank you. Tim. So clearly there's uh, momentum for progress on this issue. Governor Wallace has said he would sign a $15 minimum wage state bill. Uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul, the airport, they've all moved to $15 minimum wage. I think Target and Amazon are now paying $15 minimum wage, which puts pressure on businesses. Whatever governments do, that puts pressure on other businesses to be able to pay that same wage as well. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's an oversimplification just to simply ask yes or no on $15 minimum wage. As everyone has said, uh, this has to be a Bloomington conversation. We can't simply plug and play whatever they've done in Minneapolis or St. Paul. Bloomington is a, is a different economy. We have a different workforce. We have a different industry. We need to watch. We need to listen. 
We need to learn more. I know that the Federal Reserve and the University of Minnesota are both doing studies right now on this issue. I'd like to see that information before I move forward. But I, I think we're, we're moving in this direction. And I think, uh, as, be, as, as been said, I think this is, is a larger issue and it uh, encompasses a, a quality of life issue. It, in, it encompasses uh, a livability issue. And it's a conversation that we need to have here in Bloomington among our, our residents, among our business owners, and as a community as a whole. Great. John and Clem. I think I'm first this time. Um, since 1968, uh, with inflation uh, being factored in, the minimum wage in comparison to the cost of society has been going down. And that's coming from your national government's own studies. Um, the other part about this is almost 50% of the people in minimum wage are black and brown, and uh, over 75% are women. So when we're talking about the inequities within our society, it's not just about pay and being able to afford things, it's about who's getting paid what and, and why they're getting paid that. Part of it is education, I believe, and trying to help people get an education to move forward, absolutely. Uh, I don't think we can go to a $15 minimum wage overnight. If we do, it has to be staged. There's a lot of questions about it. It's not as easy as yes or no, but we do need to look at the inequities within our society and, and decide um, just because I'm a white male that grew up in Bloomington, why should I get more than everyone else? Why should I have more opportunity than everyone else? And the impacts to the business community uh, have to absolutely be taken to a factor of that because, as again, my dad owned a small grocery store. If you paid everyone twice what they did growing up, he wouldn't have had a store anymore. Great, thank you. So, um, you know, in my perspective, when I think about the business community as it relates to the minimum wage conversation, I can only imagine how hard it would be if you're a company that owns businesses in multiple cities and just operationally trying to figure this out. So, I do think that we're that momentum is um, going towards minimum wage, fifteen dollar minimum wage. But I would like it first to be addressed, I would like to see it addressed at the state level so that there is consistency um, across our metro area, which in my mind would make it easier for businesses. However, with that said, you know, if the $15 minimum wage conversation um, you know, did come to Bloomington, which I anticipate it will, um, I would be supportive of having those conversations. You know, like was mentioned before, people are really struggling right now, increasing rates of student homelessness. Um, we have, we're seeing more people visiting food shelves. Um, you know, people are hurting, and I don't think it's just about wages, but again, this goes back to my point of creating a community coalition here in Bloomington that includes our business leaders and all of our stakeholders, includes the, including residents, including those most impacted by low wages, figuring out what are the variety of strategies that we can um, deploy to make sure that people are, who are working here can live here and who are living here can stay here. All right, you're up. Me? All right, this question is for the city council only. So uh, let's start with um, Dwayne and Clem. Uh, what steps would you like to- Dwayne now. Oh, sorry, Dwayne now. Sorry, I'm yeah. looking at the wrong spot. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> one, one. All right. You each have one, you're tied. Not that we're keeping count. Sorry. Well, uh, what steps would you like to see the city council take to ensure a vibrant business community in Bloomington? <coughs> Stop with me. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, we've already started uh, that conversation. Um, a, uh, uh, the mayoral candidate, uh, Bussy, talked about it, our six strategic priorities that we've, we've got out there. Um, each of those are what we need to be moving forward um, and having uh, those conversations. And we have had uh, those conversations um, um, almost every year with the chamber. Uh, we've had those discussions in terms of, of the dialogue, in terms of what the city is doing and how we can partner to kind of move forward, uh, whether that be around the affordable housing process where we utilized um, uh, with our new ordinance on affordable housing, we made sure we, uh, that that, that um, would, would move forward. Um, and all of the other projects that we are, are working towards. So um, that means working on our amenities uh, that we've got out there, uh, making sure that we are uh, not only environmentally sustainable, but also fiscally sustainable as, as we, we move forward. Um, I could, I could you know, recite all six of those particular priorities, but that's really where we need to be uh, in order uh, you know, for us to be a, a city uh, of choice. All right, Al. I, um, I think the number one step would be to try to bring in the small business community in to dealing with the city council. So many of them feel disconnected from the council. They feel like they're not listening to their needs and wants of the regulations that have been put upon them. Um, so I think if we could bring the city and the small business owners together, that it would uh, greatly benefit 
increasing business in the city. All right, let's go to Susan and Sean. Susan first. Well, um, what, what can we do to attract businesses? Um, I guess uh, perhaps on-the-job training, um, partnership with Bloomington where they could offer programs for education, um, on-the-job training, uh, uh, maybe lowering educational requirements to get a specific job where they could finish their education while working or using that experience towards uh, their uh, re requirements. Um, we could maybe have courses uh, opened up over at Normandale College to uh, train people for jobs that would be moving in here and most importantly, uh, become more business friendly, especially to small business. Um, I think we actually have a fairly good model of how to do this and based on what we've been doing the last couple of years, the way that we approach the opportunity housing ordinance to uh, listen to the needs of our community and then reach out to builders and developers to find out what we could do to actually meet that need in the marketplace. Um, I do like Clem's idea of looking at how we could apply that to more commercial development and properties. Uh, we're doing it right now with restaurants, food trucks, tap rooms and things like that. We're engaging with the, the businesses in those spaces to figure out how we can change those regulations to make it less burdensome for them. I think we take that model, we go look at our hospitality industry, we look at manufacturing, we look at uh, retail, particularly in some of our smaller commercial nodes, and figure out how we can help small businesses, how we can help those ones that are there, and uh, really get that real world experience. So I would advocate that we just continue the similar model that we've been doing the last couple of years and roll it out to other portions of our economy and business community. All right, let's do Jenner and Clem. My turn to go first? All right. Yeah, so I think that Bloomington has a really strong foundation to build on in terms of attracting businesses. Like I mentioned before, we need to revisit our um, you know, regulations, zoning, um, all of the policies and ordinances that are impacting um, businesses or people who are trying to start businesses that are coming to blooming that are interested in coming to Bloomington I do think um, you know when we can take a really holistic view of our community when we think about the business community as part um, of the solution as a partner in thinking through how to improve transit how to improve housing how to make sure that we are meeting those the needs of those who are most um, you know vulnerable in our community um, I think that we're better that way we, we work better together I have really been impressed with the relationship that the chamber has with the city and I would like to see that partnership continue and strengthen um, and include even more small businesses that are in Bloomington all right, thank you all. Gosh, <laughs> sorry everyone, I'm so sorry. <laughs> you didn't start the counter yet, right? Uh, there, there's a fireman at my station who drives truck for a living, he does deliveries, and he's gone from five deliveries a day down to four, cutting his income by 20% because he can't get across town. So transportation has to be a huge part of what we do to help make this community more accessible. I, I don't mind bike lanes, but I notice in the west side of town the bike lanes are off the street and the east side of town they're on the street. So maybe we need to look at some equality across Bloomington for that particular thing. Uh, but most of all, we talked about the opportunity housing ordinance. There has to be something like that for businesses. There's parts of Bloomington that are literally dying. And unless we encourage businesses to come in, you know, the mall's done such amazing things for this town. And some people love it, some people hate it, whatever. I tell you what, it brought a lot of business here and a lot of revenue, and it's paying for a lot of things. We also need small business and small business owners to be able to do the same thing, to build striving local shops that can help our neighborhoods build community and also keep those places from being empty and blighted. Thanks. Thank you all for very um, passionate views on the business community. We do appreciate that quite a bit. So this is for the mayoral candidates, uh, Tim and Ryan, and I want to recognize that uh, Poli Police Chief Potts is here in our audience. He happens to be out in the hallway right now. Uh, thank you so much for being here, Jeff. Thank you so much for being here and all that you do. This question is relating to, um, gentlemen, what are your principles uh, for public safety in Bloomington? Would you like to start? Uh, how, uh, uh, yeah, my Tim, principles of public safety. I, I think, um, uh, first of all, I think the Bloomington Police Department is an, an outstanding 
uh, department. I think they, they do a fantastic job. They, they represent the community very well and uh, serve the city of Bloomington and have for years. And that comes from the leadership of, of Chief Potts, but also the culture within the, uh, within the uh, department. Uh, my principles are, I, I think, reflect what the, the department is, is currently underway with right now. It's community engagement. It's working with people and, and being part of the community and not being an overarching enforcement agency, but rather working with the community. The, I don't know if you've been to Coffee with a Cop or, or Taco with a Cop, or I went to White Castle with a Cop recently. Uh, a lot of good things, a lot of good community outreach and engagement which then leads to people calling the police looking for assistance for a variety of different things. And because of that, because of those engagement strategies, because of the great work that they have done, crime has dropped each year in Bloomington for the past five years. And I think that's a testament to the work that they're doing, to the, cu the culture that's in the, in, in the department, and the support that the city of Bloomington and the community of Bloomington gives to our police department. Uh, I'm in agreement. I think I think pub the public safety aspect of the city is is very strong. Um, I would agree with Tim that that engagement between um, and and bridging the gap between the community and uh, law enforcement and fire um, and EMTs, everybody that keeps us safe and healthy and first responders is is crucial. I always think that that gap can can close and get and get smaller. Um, I know a lot of people, and I'm friends with a lot of people who are on the, the police force and the fire department, um, and, and I think one thing that we can do to support them is just help them uh, with infrastructure. I mean, our fire stations are falling apart. We need to support them um, structurally. We need to invest money in the blocking and tackling of our city, and that includes our, um, uh, our facilities for public safety. So I think continuing to bridge the gap and then offering more support as far as, uh, as facilities and equipment for them uh, is essential. All right, thank you all so much. Uh, I'd like to take this moment to uh, give a round of applause to Brent Pavia, who is doing a fine job, who is managing our, uh, our time. Thank you so much. And this is Sean Broom. He is our Public Affairs Director with the Minneapolis Chamber of Commerce, and he's here to help us uh, direct audience questions. So we're gonna open it up. Who's, who would like to start? Thank you. I'd, I'd like to um, ask each candidate for their position on uh, Bloomington adopting ranked choice voting uh, for municipal offices, which would certainly include the jobs that you're all running for now. Um, I will go ahead and start. Um, I am a fan and a propon proponent of ranked choice voting. Uh, I personally am against ranked choice voting. Uh, I would fully support putting ranked choice voting on the ballot and letting the people of Bloomington decide whether or not we should be doing it here in Bloomington. He took the words out of my mouth, but I will repeat, uh, I think that's a decision for the city and not just for the city council. I guess we're going down the line here, so yeah, why not? <laughs> you don't have to answer if you don't want I think there's no reason to, to, to repeat that. I think that uh, we've got to look at this and what the impacts are. Um, I think there's a good, pretty good uh, information on both sides, and uh, I'm open to, uh, to putting it on the ballot. Uh, I would probably agree with that. I'm still on the fence with the ranked choice voting. I've watched tens of videos on YouTube explaining it. I understand it very well, but I still have my doubts about it. So, yeah, I would also support a ballot question regarding ranked choice voting and allow the people of Bloomington to choose on that issue. Um, I do think it has merits, and I, I think that uh, uh, we need to do more with education on the issue, um, as well as ans uh, a kind of having more of that conversation about what are the pros and cons of it so that our residents uh, can make an informed decision on whether or not it meets their needs. I'm not sure about ranked choice voting because sometimes you get three people in there like certain presidential elections where if there's a third person on the ballot that can upset the balance of who should actually get in there. All right, thank you. Question. Good morning, everyone. Maureen Scallon Failer. Quick question. First of all, I think there's a birthday somewhere. Sean. Happy birthday, <laughs> Happy Sean. Happy birthday. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Had to call that out. Um, you have to I appreciate thing. you holding a party for me. <laughs> <laughs> We've heard from all of you regarding the $15 minimum wage. I'm curious to where your, your position is on safe and sick leave. A lot of local uh, municipalities are addressing that, and I would like to hear yes or no yes or no if you would support a local safe and sick leave for the city of Bloomington. 
Anybody wants to start? I can start on that. <laughs> um, I think that should be up to, to the business at hand. I mean, every business is different. Uh, every industry is different. Large companies are different than, than small companies. And, uh, you know, me personally, in my businesses, um, I have a, a, a safe and sick policy. Um, I allow my employees to take time off work as needed um, if, they, if they need uh, to help their kids or um, if they have other things going on, uh, family emergencies or whatever it is, um, or if they're sick. So um, I personally have those policies, but I think it should be left up to each individual business, and I don't think the, the city government should decide on that. I, I would support a safe and sick leave uh, program, uh, but I do think, I like $15 minimum wage and like everything else, it's, it needs to be a conversation at the community level with uh, businesses and residents and, and the city involved. Um, uh, I agree. I support um, paid sick and safe time, but I would like for it to be a conversation in our community with our business community, um, with residents, and again with people who are being most impacted by this. There are several stories, I've heard several stories from pastors, from residents themselves, where they were evicted from their apartment because they had sick kids, they missed a couple days at work. Without that extra income, they weren't able, they were short on their rent, and then they were evicted. And, um, and so this is a major problem in our community. I do think that we need to have a very serious conversation about it, and I would like to see it happen, the conversation happen. <laughs> Um, you know, I think when you look at uh, why you choose a place to work, uh, the benefits that come with that uh, are one of the reasons why you would choose that. So um, if, if there is going to be anything safe and sickly, uh, it, it has to be based on both the size of the employer and the individual business. Um, uh, just like the $15 minimum wage, I don't know that you can do it across all facets of all things, um, but it, it can, it's a conversation to have. I can't say that I think that the local city government should be the one enforcing that across all businesses. That looks like we're going down the line again here. <laughs> uh, so, Maureen, thank you for the question. Um, I think it's a, it's a good question, and I'm not going to change my response that I, I gave uh, several years ago when, when you asked that before. Um, <laughs> um, and, and basically, the, the, the discussion we've got to have here is it's got to be a conversation. Um, you know, we, we look at folks um, who are in these circumstances who uh, need to utilize these things. And I, the thing I think about is my, my parents both owned a restaurant. Um, um, and, uh, you know, you got folks who are going to work that are, are cooking and they're, you know, and they're sick and they're, you know, they're getting the general population sick. So we definitely, absolutely have to have a conversation about this. And that's something I've always been open to. Um, and we cannot do a cookie cutter approach. Uh, that's why I think we do need to look at this at the local level. We've got a different um, demographic uh, outbreak here from a, from a, a marketplace. Um, like we did with the Opportunity Housing Ordinance. I think that our relationship that we have with the business community uh, is unique, and we need to continue to have that conversation. So again, I want to encourage us to have that conversation. Well, we can come up with some unique strategies that I think that would make sense, but we cannot simply just turn away from it and not decide to do anything. We need, we need, to, we need to dive into this. We need to make a decision around this. Um, I think it should be left up to each individual company. I mean, large companies, corporations use things like that to attract employees and that's one of the reasons people would go to work for them. Me as a small business owner, I always give my employees off all the time they need, maybe to my de detriment sometimes, um, but when you only have two employees you can't really be forced to do it because sometimes the budget just doesn't have the money there to do it. So I think it should be left up to each individual business. So I am sympathetic to the the plight of families that that have a sick child a sick parent um have to make that choice between missing work and uh, taking care of that person and the economic impacts of missing work i'm also very sympathetic and have experienced the the difficulty as a small business owner of someone being sick for a prolonged period of time where you only have one person doing that role and how do you backfill that um, larger corporations may be in a better position to backfill that type of thing um <clears throat> again similar to 15 dollar minimum wage I support having this conversation I support looking at finding ways to be flexible with our business community to find something that works recognizing the differences in in companies and things like that that uh, so we can meet these needs I do agree that the marketplace uh, addresses some of these issues where where you can compete for talent based on that flexibility um, and so it's it's a very difficult situation for families it's a difficult situation particularly for small business owners and I think as a, as a community working together 
we can find some reasonable solutions. We can find some reasonable middle ground on this. Well, as the last person, I'm forced to repeat what most everybody else said. <laughs> but I think that there are certainly small businesses out there that cannot afford to pay sick leave. Um, so, I mean, there it would may possibly run them on, not run them out of business, but make it difficult for them to afford. And I think that large business has a moral obligation to um, offer that those opportunities and and. Uh, and make sure that whoever is applying for the job uh, knows what they're in for if they accept it. All right, who's next? Hi, this, I'm Luann Lind, Remax Results Real Estate. So of course my question is going to have to do with home ownership. I would like your definition, and this goes to whoever, several of you have mentioned affordable housing. So how do you see proposing having a lot of affordable housing in Bloomington and still not affecting the value of our higher end homes. We want to start on that end, so Susan yeah, doesn't need to It's only fair that <laughs> <laughs> Well, Sean, Sean will be fine too. Well, I'm a, I'm a big proponent of uh, home values. I mean, most of us here are homeowners. We don't want to do anything to make uh, our value, home values go down. Um, I'm going to suggest once again that when we add more housing to the uh, community that we make it in very small pieces so that um, it doesn't affect our neighbors. I think to directly answer the question uh, is we have to be thoughtful about where new housing is developed and, and built within the city. Um, I also would like to point out kind of the flip side of that is the properties that are increasing in value the fastest within our community are those that are affordable. The ones that are $250,000 on a home ownership purchase basis and less are increasing the fastest, nearly uh, you know, double digit rates in comparison to some of those uh, more expensive houses. Um, <clears throat> which is making it difficult on the affordability side. Um, as I talked about before, market rate rents have been going up much faster than income, so we've lost over 50% of our naturally occurring affordable housing, not because people bought that development and forced the people out, but just because the market rate rents went up. Um, so as we build affordable housing, I think we can uh, uh, protect those issues and, and have a sustainable amount of growth in the cost and price of housing for the, our residents. And just a reminder, the one minute rule does still apply so that we can get mm -hmm. to as many questions as we can. Okay, good. You're doing great. I don't think I've hit 30 seconds yet. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I you get three minutes. Then. <laughs> Thanks, Al. We appreciate that. <laughs> three minutes on this one. <laughs> um, as far as affordable housing, in affecting the home prices, um, it's a lot of times it comes down to not in my neighborhood. People don't want these high density housing complexes put up in their neighborhoods, but we do need to disperse them throughout the community or we just end up clumping them all in one little location and that tends to raise crime rates. Um, so just keeping a, a moved all over the city would be a nice thing. Um, I, I guess this is not my expertise, so that's the best answer I got. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you for the question. You know, uh, I used to work for Habitat for Humanity. Uh, it's a trick bag. I mean, it really is, because it runs counter to what we're trying to do fr from the city. I know our, our city manager talked about the idea, we're going to protect uh, the value of your property. Um, so, and, and you want to be able to have those property values increase. Now, on the other hand, you know, we've got those folks who uh, we need to be able to work in our community. Uh, so you want to make sure you're providing those, um, you know, to be able to work at the mall, work in our hospitality industry, which, you know, uh, you know those two things themselves bring in over 17% of our, 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 our income. So what we've got to do is we've got to continue to do some of the innovative things we've done around protecting our our, um, our NOAA properties, uh, naturally occurring affordable housing. But we also, I believe, and I know Council Member um, Nelson and I have talked about this, we've got to look around the idea of having uh, an ownership model um, as well. So those property values continue to increase. Um, and, and there's so much more that we could talk about this, and we could certainly talk offline, but we, we, we definitely have to make sure we're protecting value and making sure we're providing affordability. A um, uh, current project I'm working on uh, is considered uh, to have some affordable units uh, for single-family homes for ownership, and the maximum level price for that is $328,200. Uh, 
that's higher uh, than what the average house value in Bloomington is. So creating affordable housing doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean creating cheap housing. Also, there's a difference between single family homes and multifamily residential. Uh, knowing where you place the multifamily residential, how that could impact the neighboring community is absolutely necessary in, in, in doing studies on that. But they're not necessarily uh, exclusive or inclusive or, you know, they're, they're not necessarily matched one to one with each other. There is the ability to create affordable housing that is actually worth more than the housing that's in the neighborhood that it's being built in. And so um, it's just based on income. It doesn't mean that everybody is on a, a Section 8 program. It doesn't mean that everybody is extremely poor. We're talking about people who make 60 to 80 percent of what the average is. That's what we're trying to fix. Yeah, so I do think that we use the term affordable housing pretty broadly and loosely almost. And um, from my perspective, you know, we have to make sure affordable housing means that we have housing options for people across the income spectrum. Um, you know, people should be able to afford their housing, I think, paying 30% of their income, right? But we have people who are spending 80% of their income on a two-bedroom two apartment in Bloomington. So it's not really, it's not, I think people hear affordable housing, and this is where I've heard concerns in the community, and they think about large, large low-income housing complexes. And that's not what we're talking about when we're talking about affordable housing in Bloomington. It really is meeting people where they're at, you know, when you think about area median income, like my opponent here said, you know, it's people who are at, you know, 80%, 60%, 50% of area median income. It is workforce housing. I mean, we need the low income housing too, but um, I think that there are some misconceptions out there around what affordable housing is and what it's going to look like in Bloomington. Um, again, thanks for the question. Um, I've, I've owned a home in Bloomington in the last decade and I sold it a year and a half ago and now I rent. So I've kind of been able to see both sides of this equation. Um, I, I believe that the, the home values in Bloomington um, continue to go up, which is a, a sign of a good economy here and a good real estate market. And I don't think you know, adding more affordable housing really has that, that large of an impact on home values in my perspective. Um, on the rental market, I think it's a different story. Um, I think as we are constructing new affordable um, housing in high density, um, or even allocating affordable housing in new construction, um, the people that pay for that difference are the current tenants. Uh, I saw my rent go up 17% uh, last year, which was very high. Um, and so I think that we need to work with current landlords that have vacancies, and I know a lot of them, um, and incentivize them to, to offer affordable housing and not just talk about building new and new development for, for affordable housing. Thanks for the question, Luann. Um, I, I think uh, Jenna had it right. I, I think we, there's, a, there's a stigma when you think affordable housing, and I try and, and frame it, no, what we need is housing that people can afford. And as she said, <coughs> across the income levels, a variety of different housing options for a variety of different folks. And uh, I, I think we have a responsibility as a city to make sure that we disperse that housing across the city. There's a complete mischaracterization that all of our affordable housing, we're just dumping it over onto the east side. I've seen that a number of times in social media. Nothing could be further from the truth. We've got about a dozen uh, uh, residential, uh, high density residential apartment buildings being in the pipeline across the city. It's going to be, uh, I think there, there are 1,400 or, or 1,700 total units, and 415 of those units will be affordable. That's across the city. We have uh, city sponsored things, HRA sponsored uh, uh, projects underway right now at uh, Penn and American and uh, south of France and Old Shakopee. It's dispersed across the city, and the most exciting thing, we let the RFP just last week for uh, development of city-owned parcels on Lindale Avenue, just across from Toro, and asking, look, looking for development possibilities that not only fit into the neighborhood, but act as a gateway to the city. So there are many ways to do this, but we have to look at dispersing it as, as reasonably and uh, responsibly as possible. All right, next question. <clears throat> Good morning. Okay. And then uh, the other side. First of all, I would like all the candidates to make sure you speak up because I know there's a bunch of old people here that have hearing aids and have trouble hearing. Uh, my name is Jim Hyland. I'm a new resident to Bloomington, and uh, I'm on the east side. And I travel Lindale, or not Lindale, but Portland and Nicollet quite a bit in the last two months getting my house ready to move in. And the bike lanes, I'd like to address the question maybe to the mayor candidates. Um, in the two months, I made a study. I counted eight bicycles in two months on the bike lanes. And I think, if 
from my perspective, the lanes are kind of a waste of space, travel space. I would like to hear your comments on it, and maybe any council comments if they like. Is there a specific question that you have? Is there a specific question? I would just like a comments on the bike lanes, what their views are on the bike lanes. Okay. Well, I think what you're specifically addressing is taking the four lane roads, two lanes in each direction, putting them on the road diet so it's one lane in each direction with a center turn lane. And uh, I, I've told people, uh, my perspective on this, those bike lanes are about fifth in the priority list when that is done in terms of, uh, in terms of putting the road on a road diet. What it does more than anything, it, does, uh, it, it makes it safer. It gives a dedicated left turn lane. We see that there are statistics that show the number of rear end accidents is, uh, on four lane roads of people stopped in traffic, in a lane of traffic, hoping to make a left turn. So it makes it safer. The other big, big, big thing is that it slows people down. I'm out door knocking and the thing that I hear across the city is that people drive too fast in Bloomington. To reduce it to a, a one lane in each direction, it slows people down. And maybe only two or three or five miles an hour, that makes a huge difference. The bike lanes on the side, yeah, they're usable. I think you know five feet for a bike lane, that's probably not even big enough on a busy street like that. Those road diets are for safety and to slow traffic down. Um. I, I agree with some of those points. However, I have seen in busy times of the day uh, with commuter traffic, um, when you slow people down, it's, it's driving nature that people get more aggressive with driving. And I've seen um, personally accidents occur uh, as, as people are trying to avoid bikers in the bike lane and getting aggressive because they're, they're being congested in, in the traffic. Uh, to Clem's point earlier, um, there's a disconnect between where these bike lanes exist within our uh, community, and I think there's probably um, a, a better location for some of these ones that are taking up, you know, half the road. All right. Thank you. Next question. This is a question for each of the candidates. What is your position on moving the council study meeting from a small second floor room to the council chamber where they can be televised and people can find them? I'll jump in first for you, Don, because I kind of figured that was going to be your question. Uh, uh, and, and, and as well you know, I brought that up at a study meeting, uh, what was it, a month, two months ago, that I, I would like, uh, our, our study meetings are, are worthwhile, they're great discussions, but to, to sit with our backs to the, the public, uh, you're right, in a small, inaccessible room, uh, I, I, it, it doesn't feel like it's, it's, it's a, uh, a, a viable or a good or a, a meeting conducive to, to the community being part of it. So I, I brought that up at a, a study meeting a couple of months ago that I want to move down to the council chambers, uh, maybe not televise them live, but certainly tape them and have them available, and, and just trying to open up, the, open up the process a little bit more so people can, uh, you can see the sausage being made. It's not pretty, Don, I can tell you that for certain, but it's, uh, you know, if you want to see it, we can certainly show it to you. Does anybody disagree with that or? No, no. okay. No. All right. Good answer. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. All right. Question. I think they all agree. They all agree with that. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Complete I mean, transparency. Yeah, I mean, there would be some varieties to it, but I mean, it's pretty close to it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. I, um, I'm Margaret Swanson. I'm two years in Bloomington, and I have a question for you. Many of you have talked about cutting back on regulations that they have for biz, small businesses. But my concern is how do you decide which regulations, if a dry cleaner wants to move in and wants to use the most polluting chemicals that run into Nine Mile Creek or into the river and says, well, we can't use other chemicals because it would be too expensive. How do you make that decision? Who, who decides and how do you decide which regulations get tossed out and which ones get um, followed? I'll hop in. Um, I, I can say that um, I don't want to see people dumping chemicals into the lake or whatever it is. That's not it. It's for me, the experience that, that my friends have had has been, I want to buy a place or move into a place within Bloomington to run my business. And as I go into that building, 
there's structural things, there's um, environmental health, there's all these other things, which can be something as simple as, hey, you need to replace that, that plumbing on that sink that you're not going to use. Um, when you go into as a business owner and want to take over a property that's been either empty or not used or, or run down because it was built 60 years ago or whatever it may be, there can be hundreds of thousands of dollars difference. Uh, Urban Land Works bought a place on 90th and Portland between Portland and Nicollet. $245,000. They were asked to spend over $600,000 to make that an office building to meet city regulations. How can someone who's running a landscape business afford that out of pocket immediately? It needs to be a plan that gets planned over a number of years with them to get it into compliance. Other people want to take a stab at that? No, I would agree with Clem on that. It's <coughs> the regulations that we would want to get rid of have nothing to do with the environment. Nobody wants to contaminate the environment with chemicals. So it would just be different building regulations that make it easier for you to run your business. Well, in order to get another, we well, want to get one more question in. Can I, can I respond to that? Yeah, absolutely. I, what, what I want to say is, I, I think the, I think the, the the asker is is hit it right on the oversimplification here. You know, we've got to right size our regulations. We've got to be sure that whatever we're doing makes sense for the entire uh, interest of the entire community. And I think that's oftentimes what. Um, uh, what we've done on council, um, when you get there and you start looking at these things, and you know you bring this 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 kind of this. I don't I don't want to say a simple uh, viewpoint. I want to be careful that I'm not saying that about about what you're saying. But we, we got to be careful when we're looking at these regulations that they make sense in the right size. Um, and so um, that would be the terminology that I would would encourage uh, those folks here who want to look at those regulations. And, and let me tell you, we have we look at those regulations uh, every year. Not not all of them, um, but we certainly go through and see what we can do to make things uh, easier. Uh, for those folks to be able to compete in the marketplace. We want our businesses to be able to be competitive in our, in our community. Um, <laughs> there would be nothing that we, we would want to do more to, to, to create those hurdles. And so we've got to make sure that we are, are creating the right uh, uh, environment and marketplace. And, 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 our, and our folks do agree. 86% um, of folks in the first district um, <coughs> think that our markets are open to that. Great. Anyone else want to take that? You know, I just... Um want to say thank you for that comment because it's absolutely true. I think for any issue that we're looking at and we're talking about transportation, economic development, housing, it's so much more complex and complicated. It's a system that we're working within. It's not just the city, it's the county, it's the state, federal, and all of those jurisdictions have different rules. And, and so thank you for that point though. I mean, it is, it's hard to get up here and have a response in one minute, right? Um, without, and we can't really get into the weeds in these conversations. So it's a good point. I would just add that. And the days will be sticking around afterwards as well, I think, as well, if you vote, just want to have direct conversations with them, too. Yeah. I, I just want to add that, that too, to the oversimplification point, there can't be a blanket thrown over this whole conversation. Um, but there, there is a lot of, in my opinion, needless overreach that occurs. For instance, uh, I can't move the building, the sign on my building four feet without getting city approval and for paying a fee um, to get a permit. Um, I'm all for approval, but I'm not all for the small fees that come along with countless items um, that are pretty nitpicky, in my opinion, for small businesses. All right. Yes, yeah, Sean, go ahead. Thank you. Um, let me just give you a real world example of how we've kind of worked on that. Um, and, and before I do that, this dovetails with the question before in terms of transparency and being able to watch this, you'd kind of see how we work mm -hmm. through many of these issues. But in housing, uh, we have uh, in the new ordinance, uh, I think 13 different items that uh, we've granted flexibility to builders and developers on reduced regulations. An example of that would be parking. However, within the ordinance, we said you have to be in proximity to transit because we know that if they have access to transit, we can have less parking demand. So we didn't just say anywhere, everywhere within our community and try to push that parking out into neighborhood streets and things like that. So that's a real world issue where it's not simple, it's complicated, and our staff does an excellent job of helping us review that information, bringing things forth, and, and really vetting those. And that was where the process, working with the builder developer community, working with uh, advocates, really worked very well. So that is how those types of regulations uh, we right size those regulations is, is through conversation and you know to the previous point of having those televised of having those available for the community to see I think people would understand a little bit better how we got to that end decision which I think would be a benefit for our community 
Great. Anyone else? That was our last question. We'll go into closing remarks. Is there anyone else that would like to add? All right. All right. Um, so closing remarks, closing statements, please remember to keep them to a minute still. Let's start with Susan and work all the way down to uh, the mayor or candidates at the end. Thank you for taking the time out of your morning. Um, we need to have a customer service attitude towards business. How can we help? I hope I have conveyed that I believe in an open and transparent local government and that does not play favorites, that creates and maintains a level playing field for all businesses in this community. I'm sure we'll all work our, together to navigate our way into the future that will surely have its challenges along the way. I look forward to hearing from you and working with you to navigate into a future I'm sure that will be challenging. If you want someone to advocate for you down at City Hall, I am that person. Thank you again for being here today, and uh, I would appreciate your support. Can you get a little closer to the mic, Sean? Can I speak thank you. Mic here? Uh, again, thank you very much. I, I appreciate the opportunity to have this conversation. Uh, when I ran two years ago, my focus was on making sure we paid attention to the needs of our neighborhoods. City has done an amazing job of development around the South Loop along 494. But I see older uh, facilities like fire stations, parks, uh, our basic infrastructure within our neighborhoods. And I want to make sure we're attending to that and the needs of that. One of the big things that I see is the need to address um, our aging commercial corridors and commercial nodes, and to be able to put together a plan to work with businesses to bring uh, uh, owners uh, opportunities uh, to help with those to, to find and look at these regulations, part of the conversation we've been having today, to make it easier for an entrepreneur to start up a small business or start a restaurant. I've been very happy to have a couple of restaurants open up near my house, uh, North Star Tavern and Carmine's. It's uh, added a level of vitality to that area. I go there now and the parking lot's full and we need to do that throughout our community. So thank you again. As a small business owner, I deal with other small business owners on a weekly basis. I make parts for several of the machine shops in town, and I bend up handrails for construction companies, and I also fix broken equipment for local landscape and construction companies to keep them running smoothly. And I can tell you that most have lost faith with the city council to the point that you're not going to hear from them because they don't think the council is listening anyway. I believe I can get these people engaged because I understand the daily struggles of running a small business that you, after you put your blood and <laughs> tears into. If we continue to disregard these businesses that have one to five employees, then we really have done a disservice to the city. When these, oh. These are the jobs that tend to be better paying and allowing workers to afford the homes in Bloomington. I would like to see Bloomington to try to attract more manufacturing jobs using tax incentives and reducing regulations. When these businesses grow, we need to be more accommodating so they're not losing <coughs> to other cities like Lakeville and Farmington, where I've watched several of my customers move to. Thank you for your time this morning. And if you have any questions for me, you can contact me at alforbloomington.com. I want to thank the chamber. And I want to thank all of those uh, who have attended uh, this morning uh, to have this conversation that we've had. In Bloomington, we're trying to cultivate a community of choice. And that is a, a community that's welcome to all. That includes businesses as well as those folks who are struggling at, at the bottom of the economic ladder. I've had that opportunity uh, to climb that ladder um, uh, from a family perspective. Now, certainly, relatives of my family have been in the military. Those folks, my, my parents both owned a, a small business. Um, and I've had conversations, too, with those folks that are out there that own small businesses within our community. And when we look at the surveys that are out there, they paint a different picture. Um, they paint a picture of a city that is moving to its past, to the boom times that we used to see in the future. And in the past, we were, will return to in the future. Um, where one place was a farm, now is a community grocery store. But we cannot take our eyes off the prize. We must look at those six strategic priorities that we've set forward, and we must move forward. And I truly believe that our best days are in front of us. The sun is shining in Bloomington. That's a metaphor. <laughs> <laughs> that was poetic. Um, 
<laughs> thank you, Dwayne, for that. Uh, thank you, everyone, for the conversation. And, uh, you know, I think as we look, there's questions about transparency. And the feedback that I've gotten from most of the community on even some of the existing projects is that the transparency with the leadership in this city has not been what they expect it to be and the engagement isn't there. I think that some of that is on the citizens to get involved, but I think a large part of this is on the council to make the information available as many different ways as possible. Uh, as we look at business within our community, uh, whether it's small or the largest, uh, it's good for us. It's good to have business here. It has to be businesses that give people jobs that help them afford housing. That doesn't necessarily mean twice what they're making today, but we do need to look at it as there is increasing inequities within our society. Um, but most of all, just know that there's a lot of people from here or new people to here that want to help grow this community and make it great. And the city's job is to encourage those people and to help those people be here and to do those things to make our community better. And it's our job to do that. Thanks. All right. Well, I want to thank the chamber, Kim, Robert, Anna, again, for organizing this opportunity. Thank you all for coming in the torrential rain. I, so I hope my goal today and what I hope you guys are taking away is that I'm absolutely committed to working in partnership with our community. And when I say our community, I mean our residents, our business partners, whether you're a small business owner, a large business owner, um, to make sure that we are really looking at our government, our local government, and ensuring that we are meeting the needs of our community members. And so, you know, I look forward to working with you in the future when I get on council. I hope that you know you can always give me a phone call, and I'm going to work with you to get your questions answered, to figure out, you know, who I need to connect you with, what resources. And again, thank you all so much for coming today, and thank you all for hosting us. Uh, I will echo the thanks. Thank you for the, uh, to the chamber for hosting the event. Thank you for all, for all coming. Um, over the last 10 years, I've been innovating and creating jobs and, and bringing revenue into this city. And even though I don't agree with all the regulations that this city currently puts on businesses, my plan is to still operate multiple businesses here in the city of Bloomington. I love this city. I've been here my whole life. And as mayor, um, it's my goal to broaden our city's perspective as a leader in the community with fresh new ideas uh, that will lead us into the future and not have us remain in the, the status quo. Uh, I think the priorities are transparency, financial responsibility, inclusivity, and making Bloomington open for business uh, once again. Those are my top priorities. Um, I'm not about revolution and uprooting a, a system that works, but I am about evolution and getting us to where we need to be so that we're set up for success in the future. So please, I would ask for your vote. Uh, in November uh, to be your next mayor of Bloomington. It would be my honor to serve you. Thank you. Well, and one final thank you to the chamber. Thanks to all for being here. Uh, this went quickly. We didn't get to a number of topics, including workforce development, which I can't believe we didn't talk about. Um, I, I will say a couple of things. First of all, uh, hearing the comments about small businesses and, and the pressures they face and the challenges they face, message heard loud and clear. That will absolutely be a priority, I think, moving forward. But I also want to say that I'm a uh, glass half full kind of guy. And I want to remind everybody that Monday night at our council meeting, we approved uh, Drive Shaft, which is a, a new golf facility on 494. We approved a 67,000 square foot addition to Skywater Technologies. Uh, I, I know that the, the home furniture store is coming up out of the ground. RBCU is expanding. Forklifts Minnesota is expanding. Donaldson is expanding. All those companies, folks, none of them are in the South Loop. Expansion and work is going on across the city. In the South Loop, we've got new hotels going in that's gonna, that will push the number of hotel rooms in the city of Bloomington to greater than 10,000. And let's not forget Whirly Ball that just opened recently as well. <laughs> Bloomington business is strong, and it's because of you, and it's because of the chamber, and thank you very much. And I would ask humbly for your vote in November. Thank you so much. A round of applause. Thank you all. <laughs> Running a candidate forum with eight candidates is complicated, but I want to applaud to you all for uh, a wonderful conversation, and hopefully you all gain some insight uh, before you go and vote in November. Thank you again to the Mall of America, our presenting sponsor today, as well as Excel Energy. Uh, they sponsor these forums every year, and we appreciate the work that you're doing in the business community. Thank you also to 
the Bloomington Center for the Arts and ho hosting us here in the Black Box Theater, Kevin Ramich, our new executive director with Artistry. We are in his backyard today and we really appreciate that. Uh, let's see, I think we're good. Um, thank you to Robert. It's wonderful to work with you. Uh, it's, you know, you have it's a wonderful great- wonderful to work with you too, Kim. Thank you. We each made gaffes, which made it a lot more fun. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank, you. thank you again. I think people will stay around for questions and we look forward to continuing this dialogue for the next few months. Thank you so much. Yep, great. Well, that's job. Job. Oh, thank you also, Sean.